Howdy, everyone. Howdy. Howdy. Good evening. Thank you for joining us. My name is Fritz Bartel, uh, and I'm an assistant professor of international affairs here at the Bush School. On behalf of the Albritton Center for Grand Strategy uh, and the Scowcroft Institute of International Affairs, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this evening with Dr. Paul Kennedy. A couple of housekeeping items just before we get started. Uh, First, uh, those of you here, if you could mute your cell phones uh, throughout the event, that would be much appreciated on our part. Uh, please also no video of the event. Uh, we'll, we'll be recording it and, and we're broadcasting it uh, right now on Zoom. Uh, to those of you on Zoom, uh, please remain muted uh, throughout, the, throughout the event. If you have a question, please put it in the chat uh, and Kelly Robbins will uh, enter those questions into, into the conversation when, when the time is right. Um, it's, my, uh, it's my honor to introduce our distinguished guest who has joined us to talk about his timely, river, riveting, and beautiful new book, uh, Victory at Sea, Naval Power and the Transformation of Global Order in World War II. I'm sure many of you know uh, Professor Kennedy, or know, know of Professor Kennedy, and he needs no introduction. Nevertheless, it's worth reflecting for a moment on the scale of his achievements, and this is where he will uh, start to uh, wish that I was not, was not going on and on. <laughs> so I will try to, try to keep it brief. Uh, Dr. Paul Kennedy is the J. Richardson Dilworth Professor of History at Yale University, where uh, I'm sure he would uh, very much want me to say he has taught generations of students in military history, grand strategy, uh, geopolitics, and the wisdom of life. Uh, he is the author of some 16 books, including most famously, as many of you know, The Rise and Fall of the Great Powers, which appeared in 1987, just as our school's namesake, George H.W. Bush, was beginning his run for the White House, his successful run uh, of the next year. Since then, he's produced enormously influential scholarship on the United Nations, trends in the global economy and geopolitics, and the men and women who engineered the Allies' victory in World War II. Through it all, he's garnered just about every honor that uh, one can receive, including being, a, being appointed a, com a commander of the Order of the British Empire in 2001. But it's not really the scale of his accomplishments. I wanted to, to say in my introduction that makes it such an honor to have him here tonight. It's rather the values that Professor Kennedy embodies and has embodied throughout his long and distinguished career. And of course, at Texas A&M and the Bush School, we uh, hold values in, uh, in, a, in a special place. I'm honored to have come to know Professor Kennedy on a personal level, and I can tell you he has something to offer each of us. As students, we can all draw inspiration from his endless desire to keep learning. As teachers, we can all learn from his endless willingness to help future generations succeed. And as citizens, we can all, now more than ever, learn from his desire to use knowledge to better our country and the world. I'm quite sure we'll see all of those values, the values of learning, of teaching, of using knowledge to better the world on display tonight. So without further ado, it's my pleasure and my honor to introduce Professor Paul Kennedy. Thank you, Fritz. Uh, and ladies and gentlemen, may I say I'm honored to be with you and really look forward to talking and then having a Q&A with you a little later. I, I would ask uh, Fritz or anybody else if they could kind of reduce the, the light shining directly from there into my eyes, if there's a, a way in which I could uh, be less on the... Okay, um, that really helps. <laughs> <clears throat> I, I want to tell you a story, ladies and gentlemen, of um, how I came to write a book which I had no intention of writing uh, and had no plan for writing, uh, which is this one. And the story has to go back to about six or seven years ago when I was uh, just 
wondering what I would do after my book, Engineers of Victory, I thought I would be returning to try to do a, uh, start drafting the kind of for, new forward and uh, reflections on my rise and fall of the great powers, and then maybe go on to a study of the imperial thought of the uh, British, uh, British novelist and, and poet uh, Rudyard Kipling. I, I, do, I did have a friend who was a, uh, a marine artist who lived up in Maine um, called Ian Marshall. And I was fond of ordering from Ian Marshall once a year as a birthday present to myself one of his wonderful marine scapes of a warship set in a particular historic uh, background of ships which had been, which my father and my uncles had been part of a construction of as boilermakers on Tyneside near Newcastle upon Tyne in the Second World War. Uh, and I got very fond of this, uh, this, this very gentle, uh, quiet, architect turned uh, artist who had worked in Rhodesia and South Africa before coming to the States where he married. And I was really pleased to learn from Ian one day that he was uh, doing a whole lot of new paintings on aircraft carriers, uh, especially before, during, and after the Second World War, because uh, he had been asked if he could produce a array of paintings of carriers which would be hung on a permanent exhibit in New York off the Hudson, in the Hudson Valley, in the Hudson River, when the uh, uh, veteran carrier, uh, Intrepid, would come back from a three-year refit. And there would be, as part of a museum exhibition, there would be a lot of paintings on the, on the history and evolution of the carrier, especially the U.S. carriers. So it was to my distress that one day I, I bumped into Ian looking very downcast because it turned out that a, a new and a very rich gentleman had become the new chairman of the board of the Intrepid uh, Museum and uh, his dynamic wife thought that this room which was to be for Ian's exhibition should be converted to be a playroom for children when they're on board the aircraft carrier. I kid you not. So uh, Ian's hopes of having his paintings exhibited there were dashed. He had, of course, written a whole, done a whole number of coffee table books on uh, ironclad warships, on uh, flying boats, on uh, uh, passages to India, on uh, as merchant ships and passenger ships going from the British Isles and France to India, and he had. He had done enough pictures of warships that I suggested he do a fresh uh, coffee table book on warships of the Second World War. And if he managed to get ahead of, with that, uh, I, since I was going into, into uh, two hip operations, uh, would, would be sitting on a sofa that summer and could write the foreword to his uh, his, war, his warships of the Second World War. Uh, after a while, I discovered that Ian was not getting much of a text ready for his wonderful paintings, so I agreed with a further hip operation coming up that I could maybe write the text, the simple text of this thing. Uh, and so I got decided to put aside my plans for the new uh, edition of Rise and Fall of the Great Powers and spend the next year like writing the text of this uh, illustrated book. And was getting into it nicely when uh, I got a phone call just before Christmas from his daughter saying, I'm afraid to say that Ian's had a massive heart attack and has died in his kitchen up in, um, in Maine. And Either the project could go on with me carrying it on, or I could just, you know, let, let the paintings go and stay in this nice little studio, and, um, and that would be it. 
Um, I did go up to see his studio, drove up with a graduate student and discovered there were many, many more interesting paintings there that I didn't know about. And so I decided to continue to write a single volume draft uh, text of the, of the war at sea. And then find a publisher who is willing to be able to take these wonderful original color, watercolors and embed them in the text, not cluster them together as the big commercial trade publishers in Manhattan wish to do. They definitely wish to do a book by Paul Kennedy on the war at sea, um, but they did not want to spend the energy and time and the technical uh, frustrations of doing a illustrated work with the paintings embedded in the text. So I eventually found that wonderful press, Yale University Press, which has a great reputation for doing illustrated uh, British landscape histories, British country house, Turner, Constable, and other things like that. And so, so it turned out that this was the perfect choice, although it slowed things down once again. And as I worked on this book, I began to realize being the academic in me, uh, looking at Ian's paintings about early paintings of the defeated and destroyed British and American warships in the Second World War, and then the later paintings where after 42, 43, things begin to change, and then the, the paintings, the astonishing paintings of the of the warships in Tokyo Bay at the end of the war. There was a story to be told here, which was not just the narrative of events of the Battle at Sea, but to answer the question, where did the change and where did the change come from? And this got back to the older Paul Kennedy of the rise and fall of the great powers, the interest in sheer economic and technological heft, which as it rises, to benefit a new country coming to the top could be explained and analyzed if you went deeply enough. And I thought I could therefore, ladies and gentlemen, write a, a, a naval history of this war, which was a bit like the writings of the great French historian Ferdinand Braudel, who had written of the Mediterranean and the Mediterranean world of the age of Philip II and offered the idea that uh, at the base of the area you were covering, there was the, the, the profound history, the history of what happened there in the geography and tides and the, and the climate, which never really changed. And then there was a second middle level of transformations which occur when new technologies, new products, and trade comes in to affect and change things. And at the top of this three-decker cake was the history of events, the history of the battles, what uh, Brodel called the L'Histoire d'Enemont, uh, the Spanish Armada, the Battle of Lepanto. They were at the top of his story. And so I want to try to do, a, if you like, a Brodelian history of the uh, Naval Encounters of the Second World War, pull in Ian Marshall's paintings, and put it all in a nicely packaged new book with Yale University Press. So it can be read and it can be seen at various different levels. There's a particular chapter in this book which has not got any paintings of Ian's. It's full of statistical tables of the shift in the, in the productive power balances, but they explain as I'll try myself to explain in a few minutes, what is going on. Ian's paintings are here for you to see. The Japanese aircraft carrier Kage, actually battle cruiser built in British yards before the First World War, successful until it was defeated and sunk in, in the Pacific. Uh, the merchant ship convoy in the Atlantic, uh, SS Ohio, the oil carrier, oil tanker limping into Malta to relieve Malta. Uh, I relied very heavily in doing this book on the, the uh, two official histories of the Second World War, uh, 
Morrison's 15-volume official naval history and Captain Roskill's four-volume War at Sea, the British and the American histories, to get me started. And then I started reading many, many more books and professional articles to move this along. There's Brodel, the person I was referring to. It's interesting that Brodel, at the end of that history of the Mediterranean world, said that, you know, by 1600, the Mediterranean world was beginning to fade and the balance of naval power was shifting westwards, westwards towards the Atlantic. And I'm going to tell a story of the balance of naval power after 1942 shifting even further westward to the United States. This is Brodell's, I won't go into this, uh, the long durée of the basic unchanging elements, the conjuncture, and at the top, the history of events, the history of events, the history of the battles and the convoys and everything else like that. What an ambitious book this one is. Wow. No wonder it costs so much. <laughs> this is the cruel sea of Nicholas Montserrat. This is the cruel sea of uh, torpedoes in the Atlantic. I want to tell the story of the winning of the Battle of the Atlantic as it was portrayed by Ian and as it was narrated and organized by myself. But I also wondered, here was a further crazy ambitiousness to this book. I wanted to grapple with what my political science colleagues did when they wrote about long cycles in world history. From time to time, they said, a great new power combination rose to the top. It was connected with, Brodel, it was, um, with economic long cycles there. And there's a whole subfield in political science and IR theory of, of this sort of stuff, this sort of sea power in global politics, which when you get into it, if you bother looking at this, has got no pictures in it at all. It, in fact, it's hardly got any naval battles in it at all. It's IR theory put in terms of, 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 of long, long, like long great power theory. But I wanted to say something about that if I could. Uh, this is the Modelsky, okay, Professor Modelsky's long cycles in world politics from the Portuguese cycle. That's when Porti Portugal is the leading uh, mercantile country in the world, the Dutch cycle, the British cycle, and on to the American cycle. Phew, you could really go to sleep fast when you're looking at this literature, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> but it is intriguing and intellectually challenging. Uh, but this is a different story. The, the you know, British converted destroyers working on the Atlantic convoys and doing something historically very significant, which I'm going to tell you about in 15 minutes' time. This is the surface war, the surface part of, uh, of Brodel. This is a history of events, but there's something deep happening uh, underneath this story. This is where the produ productivity revolution of the United States shipyards and air aircraft production gets you by 1943. This is the brand new USS Essex, the first of 24 fleet carriers built by US shipyards in the war. This is a display, of course, of all of the, all of the aircraft probably assembled before political figures and the chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee or something before it goes off to San Diego and to the war in the Pacific. Um, it, it was interesting to me, and maybe some of uh, the naval history experts and Navy buffs in this room will know it, that by the beginning of 1943, that is six months after the famous Battle of Midway, which many people say caused the victory of the, of the Second World War in the Pacific, was the turning point, was less of a turning point than you think, ladies and gentlemen. Almost all of the six great fleet carriers which the U.S. Navy had at the beginning of the war by then had been sunk. One way or the other, uh, the Battle of Coral Sea at Midway, in, uh, uh, sunk by a Japanese uh, U-boat, uh, the Wasp, that is, uh, all of them except the elderly Saratoga. Uh, that was a single uh, aircraft carrier Admiral Halsey had in the Southwest Pacific. 
in the beginning of 1943. In fact, uh, the US Navy was so desperate for aircraft carrier uh, sort of power that it asked the Royal Navy if it could send over to the Southwest Pacific one of its new Victorious class fleet carriers. I did not know this story until Ian Marshall showed me a really pretty painting of the Saratoga joined by HMS Victorious in May 1943. Uh, the, the Victorious uh, was equipped with US carrier aircraft so that the two carrier uh, pilot crews could work together. It was given the uh, <laughs> a really interesting name, which is a puzzle uh, to most historians of this time, it, because they didn't want to give the impression that the U.S. Navy was rescuing, was being rescued by the Royal Navy, it was given the name of USS Robin. For those of you who wish to investigate this, and you can ask Google what USS Robin was, this is the mysterious USS Robin, which came to the Southwest Pacific for a while, operated under Halsey before those, the first of those Essex-class carriers started coming in. By June and July 1943, there was an Essex-class carrier, brand new carrier, coming to join Nimitz's fleet in Pearl Harbor every four weeks. One, two, three, four, five, six. By the first operation and later in the Pacific against the Gilbert Islands in nine, uh, November and December 1943, the American carrier admirals had 10 to 14 carriers. It's because of a productivity revolution which is underpinning all of this. So this is the type of carrier and the new Hellcat fighter a uh, very tough fighter uh, produced by Grumman with this enormously powerful engine, which together account for an enormous destruction of Japanese fighter and bomber aircraft in the Pacific. Uh, where does the Hellcat fighter come from originally? How do you describe uh, the product chain which would help uh, us understand the shift in the productivity of the United States, enable it to fight in the Pacific. This is what my three Kennedy boys called dad's sausage chain, right? You work at it from one way at the other. Uh, the, at this end is the great Mariana's turkey shoot in the middle of 1944, where the, these Hellcats shoot enormous number of Japanese aircraft out of the sky. That's why they called it the turkey shoot. And if you went backwards, you would get the nest link as they fly from the Essex. But let me take you from the other side. The, the, this aircraft revolution in the Pacific and also in, of course, in heavy bombers needed an incredible amount of this new product of aluminum. And where does aluminum come from? It comes from aluminum ores, which can only be found some of them in Canada and some of them in British Guyana and Suriname. In the hillsides, the ore, bauxite ores in the hills of Zur Suriname. The um, U.S. Was, began to be so concerned with this, ore, with this strategic product that they actually had the U.S. Marines guarding these neutral Dutch bauxite ores from before the, the U.S. entered the war in 1941. The bauxite mines are there. The bauxite is dropped in the harbor into all carriers They're escorted by Royal Navy destroyers across the Caribbean because remember Admiral King doesn't believe in destroyer escorts to keep, to keep and protect our merchant ships. The, the ore is put into barges, it goes up the Mississippi, it goes to the gigantic Alcoa Aluminum Corporation of America refinery, they produce all sorts of products, including, including uh, propellers, including the, the casings of, of, uh, of, of aircraft engines. They are brought to the Pratt & Whitney factory near Hartford that produces a gigantic P2800 engine, which goes into the Grumman 
sent to the Grumman factory in Long Island, which is then put into the Hellcat, which is then constructed, which, which means that the Hellcat is then a finished, powerful aircraft. It's flown across the country. It goes on the decks of the USS Essex, as you saw. The Essex goes to the southwest and central Pacific. And the great Marianas turkey shoot takes place. One thing after another. You, those of you who are interested in product chains and failures of product chains across the Pacific coming in the other direction will know why this is significant part of a story. I got so frustrated, ladies and gentlemen, in looking at all sorts of books about the war in the Pacific or the war in the Atlantic with sentences which said, uh, with the coming of, with the advent of the long-range P-51 fighter, with the new heavy you know, four-engine Lancaster bombers, with the arrival of the Essex aircraft carriers, and the, the, the historian in me was screaming, like, where do they come from? In fact, after a while, I and my research assistants used to have cut out, pinned on my, on my refrigerator at home, sentences from other people's books, which was, with the coming of, with the advent of, with the arrival of, and we would say, ah, with the coming of means that there is a story behind it, a production and organizational story. The beginnings of the victory in the Pacific does, it does not start with the Hellcat fighters going and shooting down. They had to come from somewhere. The aircraft carriers had to come from somewhere. So many of the wonderful ships that Ian Marshall produces and, and describes and paints comes from somewhere. The critical convoy battle of, uh, of May 1943 is another part of the story in, uh, in this book and in the story of the winning of the naval advantage as late as, as May 1943, because it's only then that these long lines of, of uh, Admiral Dönitz's wolf packs, and he puts out four wolf packs to try to destroy this empty hulled but nevertheless important return convoy coming from Liverpool across to New York in early May 1943. What is going on here in the Battle of the Atlantic? What is also to support Ian Marshall's paintings? This vidette is a small uh, modernized British destroyer, which I mentioned to you. It receives very late in the day, two weeks before the convoy sets sail, this brand new invention of miniaturized radar. Therein is a tale, which actually I tell in a certain chapter in my earlier book, uh, Engineers of Victory, which is why I didn't want to do anything more about this stuff, but then I found myself going back to it. The Videt is one of the uh, escorts of ONS-5 convoy, which finds itself off the Newfoundland banks in May the 5th and 6th of 1943, with the mists coming in in the middle of the dark and nobody can see more than about 150 yards, except those small ships which now have this new invention of radar. And so the, the German U-boats coming in for the attack are blind and cannot see anything. These ships with the radar can see and detect. And it gave the historian and me such enormous pleasure and go to the Naval Archives and the Public Record Office in London and find the report of the convoy commodore and the leading naval, um, naval uh, commander of the escorts to show what was happening in the middle of the night. Um, half hour after half hour, the, uh, as you can see uh, at 10.30, that is half past midnight, Corvette Loosestrife makes a radar contact, makes an ad 
as the conflict makes, makes a radar conflict, Videt makes a radar contact in the dark and heads out towards that little contact on the surface and attacks with depth charges or homing port torpedoes and destroys around that convoy alone five U-boats and damages seven others. At the end of this long battle, Dönitz writes in his daily uh, naval staff account of the war, it looks like we have lost the Battle of the Atlantic. Ian was terrific in painting these small ships that I'll show you in a minute. This is a cavity magnetron, um, which, uh, of which the original was brought by the British and given as a gift to Veneva Bush, uh, FDR's chief uh, science uh, advisor. It now rests in the MIT Science Museum up in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts. It was the invention of two British postdoctoral uh, fellows in science and physics uh, in 1940 to 41, but we needed a lot of training and production to get thousands of them put in the long range aircraft like the B-24s and in the, uh, and in, the, in the small escort vessels of the British and American fleets. This, these are the patrol aircraft which come out and begin to dominate by patrolling in the air all the time. The very long range B-24 Liberators with a, something like a 20 hour span. The Vickers Wellington bombers with all of the new radar detection equipment uh, in them. This is what happens in the Battle of the Atlantic, uh, a, a bit of a chart which I put together. The, um, you can see the incredible losses in March 1943 of uh, British merchant ships or allied merchant ships in the Atlantic. You can see that figure drop down, 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 especially May to June after that critical convoy, you begin to see that more U-boats are being destroyed than merchant ships. Advanced new technologies coming in like this um, really make the difference. This is the U-boat losses year by year. This is that uh, chapter in the book, uh, Victory at Sea, chapter eight, which tries to do the statistical story of the transformation of the power balances. 1942, Dernitz said we lost 87 U-boats, but if we're producing about 15 or 18 a month, that's okay. Losing 240 U-boats in one year is not okay. Behind the power shifts of 1943 are the long-range Liberator bombers, are the uh, Hellcat fighters, are the cavity magnetrons, the cavity magnetrons, ladies and gentlemen, which you have, all of you possess one of those, uh, and you, they reside in your kitchens. Everybody here has a cavity magnetron in their kitchen. What is it? Microwave. The microwave, yes. The intense heat of the mic. Of this, in, of this new invention was such that if you could control it and put it and turn it to commercial use, it's your microwave. Um, here, are the, here is the surge in US aircraft carrier production. Carrier after carrier after carrier. Must have been amazing and also daunting to a Japanese patrol aircraft to see what was happening here by 1944. All of those are Essex-class lar large fleet carriers. Here is the uh, aircraft production of the United States by 1943. Once again, you see the epic rise up from 42 to 43. By this time, you might argue without being uh, accused of being a Marxist that a production revolution had occurred here, and there was there was no way in which Japanese or German output could match that, try as they must. Here is the shift in the naval power balances, uh, which is a, a, 
the worship tonnage year by year of each of the uh, six great navies which were around at the beginning of the of the war. You see the Royal Navy with the largest amount of tonnage there, the US Navy and the Japanese Navy almost close together because of the way the Japanese built and cheated on the, on the treaty uh, controls. The three European navies a bit less. And then by 42, going into 1943, you see this incredible transformation of the epic output of warship tonnage production. Behind it is that terrific change in the amount of billions of US dollars in value which were put to armaments production. This, I, I, I use various statistics like this to teach my uh, Yale undergraduates about the importance of looking at statistics and teasing those statistics out and deconstructing charts. Look here, ladies and gentlemen, in 1940, when the US is still neutral, that's why it's in brackets there, it has 1.5 billions worth of armaments production. The Germans have produced more than anybody else, which is why they're winning the early parts of the war. The British are trying to catch up. By 1941, 42, the British are catching up, but by 1943, one single nation is surging forward with armaments production, which is equal to all of the others combined. This has never before occurred in history. When do hegemonic power shifts occur and why, I ask my political science colleagues who are telling me about Modelsky, long shifts in, in world power distribution. And I, they say, well, it's because, well, it's happened in the Second World War. And when I say, well, why did it happen in the Second World War? And what caused it to happen? And how do we measure it? And like, like what's a convoy escort? And they say, well, I don't know anything about that. I know about Modelsky long cycles in world history, but nothing else. Why do hegemonic power shifts occur? They occur at the end of very long wars of attrition. This is the famous Battle of Rocroi, which is the last battle in which the great Spanish infantry, successful for many, many years, falls back and is defeated. This is that wonderful female author, Wedgwood, describing that if you go to the battlefield of Rock Croy, you can see a simple little monument, an unassuming gray monolith, the end of the Spanish army. One might say of the greatness of Spanish greatness. When does that happen? Over time, of course, because these are hegemonic shifts in world affairs. The historian and Kennedy, the naval historian Kennedy, wants to know more about that, wants to dig in, and wants to uh, use the extraordinary paintings of Ian Marshall to help me tell this story. That's what these 54 original paintings in this book are doing here. There is the graveyard of Dernitz's you boat bid. They've all surrendered and go into a port in Northern Ireland. This full, wonderful color painting of Ian's, which is in the le very late part of the book, is of the US battleships and aircraft carriers and British battleship Duke of York there in Tokyo Harbor in September 1945 with, you can't see it very well here, but Mount Fuji is in the background. It is a really lovely painting, symbolic, of not only the victory, the Allied victory at sea, but symbolic of the rise of US naval power, the rise of US to be number one in world affairs, the transformation of the world order. So look again at the title of this book of mine. Victory at Sea will remind some of you of watching that fabulous US um, sort of TV documentary uh, with the wonderful music of Richard Rogers in the background. I think it was 15 part series, which I would goggle at when I was a teenager back in the north of England in the 1950s. But, the, but it's, the, 
it, it's the subtitle of this book, which is about naval struggle and the transformation of the world order. This is what I'm trying to do very ambitiously, you might say, in this book. Rescue Ian Marshall's paintings so they just were not left in you know, the artist's studio or tossed in the bin. Uh, bring them out in an illustrated history. Bring an analysis with statistical tables of the shift in the balances of, among the great powers and re related to some interesting uh, political science literature on why great powers rise and fall and hegemonic shifts in world affairs. So um, copies of this book have gone to Ian's uh, widow, Jean Marshall, up in, the, uh, in New Hampshire now. And I'm hoping to, hoping that she will feel proud of all of the wonderful paintings which are in this book. She will just get her copies this week because this is the first week of production. I'm not sure Fritz will have got anything after this, but maybe I have. Once again, Kennedy the statistician, <laughs> right? Uh, one of my, one of my uh, <coughs> research assistants who's working now at the University of London, War Studies, found a, a very detailed scholarly article by two scholars which had found the data of the warship tonnage production of the six lady leading navies over a long span, and they were doing statistical analyses of it all. And I asked Aaron if he could turn it, transform it in an illustrative way. Look at this, ladies and gentlemen. Overall warship tonnages of the powers. Somewhere in the middle of the Second World War, one new hegemonic naval power just burst out to have the tonnage of more than all of the other navies of the world. It's now no longer that size. If we continue to do the analysis, and many of you in this audience know where I am going, the serious reduction in the number of warships within the U.S. Navy and the total tonnage of that compared with a country which is not here in these graphs. The Chinese Navy has not yet arrived. Another contender for naval mastery is still a little bit further after the year 1960. It's not there in 1980. It's just beginning in the year 2000. It's getting pretty close. The gap is still a wide one. We still have the large Nimitz class aircraft carriers. But this story just goes on and on and the shifts occur over time because of basic competitive productivity shifts between the great powers. Matelsky and Thompson were right. A hegemonic outcome had occurred there had been, this is another long cycle in history. This is the story I tell, victory at sea, naval power, and the transformation of the global order in World War II. I'm so grateful to you for listening in to this story, my account of how this book, which I didn't intend to write, ladies and gentlemen, six years ago, became something which I was going to write the forward to, then became something which I was going to write the basic text to. And then, you know, like some crazy kook, I started adding in like Modelsky and long cycle stuff and, and statistics and everything else. And it ends up with this uh, production of Yale University Press, which is a, as you see when you have a copy and go through it, it's like two or three different books in one. I've tried to be ambitious here, but I've, I've tried to tell a story in the most interesting way possible. And the only thing I can say in favor of two years of COVID restriction in the Kennedy kitchen and in the Sun Lounge, ladies and gentlemen, was because we didn't want to bring it out when Barnes & Noble stores were closed and I couldn't come and give talks, that I would just go back and try to do as my old editor at Random House, Jason Epstein, told me to do 
Paul, he would say, for every 17 words sentence, you can always turn it to a 12-word sentence without losing much of the, most of the content of what's in it. So go back again and again and again. Near the end of this long story, my, my youngest um, grandson, uh, Charlie Parker Kennedy, that really is his name, Charlie Parker Kennedy would keep coming up from North Carolina and saying, is the book finished yet? And I've just sent an email to Charlie Parker Kennedy saying, you, next time you come up to New Haven, there's a copy for you, Charlie Parker Kennedy. The book is really finished. And here it is, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for your attention. Is that okay? Okay. I'm now hearing myself more. Um, whoa. <laughs> you were right. You knew. Abbott and Costello. Um, well, thank you very much, Paul, for that wonderful talk. Thank you f very much for this book, which I, uh, I have to say, as I was reflecting on it, um, if nothing else, and there is much else about it that succeeds uh, amazingly well, and it's just a joy to read. It's also a joy to have as a physical book, which in 2022, uh, you know, is not necessary, of course. But this, it, it reminds you why you you want to hold books, and and to have this unique product that incorporates these paintings. Uh, it's it is a true work of art, both for the prose within it and the and the artwork as well. Um, I don't want to take too much. We have about 35 minutes uh, for q and I, I won't take too much of the time. We, do, we will have a couple of microphones uh, kind of going around the room. So as you raise your hand, um, we'll, I'll try to direct them. And, and then you can, uh, if you can introduce yourself and ask your question when, when the time comes, uh, please feel free to do so. For those of you on Zoom, Again, if you can type your questions uh, in the chat, uh, Kelly will uh, kind of intervene when the, when the moment is right so we can include you uh, as well. Um, Paul, thank you again for, for your wonderful talk and for this, uh, this book that gets us to focus on these long-term material shifts and, and technological shifts that then in this moment of World War II kind of uh, burst onto the scene in this dramatic hegemonic power shift. I was wondering if, uh, as my opening kind of question to you, if the book made you think about leadership in World War II in a different way. So by, by the time you get to this chapter eight, which is a, a spectacular chapter about these power shifts uh, as it took place in World War II, you can see that, that the United States is just miles and miles ahead of everyone else. And yet you rightly say that this is, uh, you know, it's not a purely determined story. And so I, as I, I wondered as you put this book together, if you ended up thinking about the leaders and, the, and leadership during this war, perhaps where it was found, where it was most important, mm -hmm. it may not be at the presidential level or, or, or kind of what, what levels in, in, your, in, your, um, in your chain did you end up seeing leaders that, uh, that mattered, and, and how did you end up thinking about leadership uh, as you went about this, this story that has these structural forces at work? There's no doubt that this is, <clears throat> this kind of be seen just at, at this deterministic analysis of the production shifts, and that's all about it. It, it is about Brodel's history of events, and it is about how leaders and, and systems who are full of leaders respond to that 
Uh, one of uh, Ian's paintings shows a bedraggled bunch of British infantrymen being debouched out of a destroyer which has come back from Dunkirk after the uh, astonishing German, def German advance in the West and the beginnings you see of the fall of France and, um, and, and the transformation of the war in Europe in a remarkable way in the first nine months of a year. Uh, nine months of the war, I mean. And that, that image and the report back over to this country of the fall of France and the defeat of the Allies, both from the Norway campaign down to the fall of France, caused a really frightened leadership in Washington to respond to that. It was a true coincidence that the, uh, the, 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 the U.S. Navy secretary and the admirals were going to testify to the Congress in the middle of uh, June 1940 uh, about the need to give them more money to, to the perennial wave in which the military goes to the Congress to persuade them, can you give us a bit more money for the Air Force or the Army or the Navy? And that particular day in which the Navy Department was making its case, the senators and the congressmen opened the Washington Post, and there was that report and photos of the fall of France, the threat to England, the threat to the Atlantic, and therefore, when the Congress deliberated on this, pushed along in the background, of course, by FDR, who wanted this to happen, the Congress decided to double the amount that was being requested by the Navy. And the amount that was being requested by the Navy, you know, it was really large amount. It was a, something that had killed off an elephant. <laughs> and it, it was doubled within two weeks of deliberation, but it took another two years of time. It takes an awful lot of time to construct, design an Essex class carrier. It took an awful lot of time to find the new materials, to design the, the new wonderful aero engine for the Grumman Hellcat. And so, as, I, as, you sh as you see in this story, it's not until 43 that it happens, but leadership has to take long-term roles in agreeing to uh, invest in the right products to, to see that somewhere out there in the future we, you will get the transformation of war. In that two years, the British under Churchill had the toughest task. They stood alone, as Churchill called it, from June 1940 to uh, the German attack upon, uh, upon the Soviet Union in June 1941, and then the later transformation when Japan attacks Pearl Harbor in December 41, and shortly after that, an infuriated Hitler decides to declare war on the United States. We don't declare war on the US, and we don't declare war on Germany first, it comes the other way. So by the beginning of 1942, there's still the need for leadership, for <laughs> what you would call fireside chats, for the encouragement of the nation, for the mobilization of the millions of people in this country, from Rosie the Riveter to those going off to the fronts. And the story of, therefore, leadership in that critical part of the war and decisions about going and explaining to the Congress well why you needed the taxpayers' dollars is a significant background story of the steady winning of the war by the democracies in the West. Makes sense. Uh, um, so let's w perhaps we can take two two questions from the room, and then we'll move online. So if anyone has a question that they'd like to ask, I see, I believe that's Ted in the back corner there. Uh, Professor Kennedy, thank you so much for a great talk. Um, I wanted to, um, I'm, and I work with the Economic Statecraft Program at the. Thanks Bush for School. explaining who you are. Thanks. Yes. Um, yeah, so I wanted to ask you, um, one of the, I think, the debates uh, that's had in the context of a potential conflict with the U.S. and China is what's necessary for a force structure. So China is building a large fleet of submarines. They're giving a lot of focus on 
missiles and they're looking at U.S. capital ships and large vessels and saying, well, you can build big vessels, big tonnage, we'll destroy them. And so I'm curious, as, as you think about um, your work and maybe even just the potential for a conflict, do you think the U.S. is, is building the right sort of force? Like, does tonnage still matter if China is going to mm -hmm. produce these anti-access area of denial capabilities? Thanks. Thanks for asking that question. Ladies, ladies and gentlemen, it's a, it's a really important one. What particular weapons platforms of what size do you need which will fit the particular geopolitical context of where the fighting is to take place? If in the Battle of the Atlantic you really needed a large, very large number of those small destroyer escorts like the HMS Fidette, and in the wide ranges of the Pacific, the platform were to be the new long-range, super long-range uh, SS-class carriers in, in task forces. Um, what did you, what, what sort of platforms, what weapon systems do we think will work out best in the way in which our Navy and the DOD is planning, anticipating, trying to understand the rise of the Chinese Navy and Chinese power in the far west of the Pacific. How is it that Chinese, although there is already the beginnings among some ambitious Chinese admirals of more and more aircraft carrier production, the Chile, ch clearly for the past few years, they have been building uh, platforms and weapon systems which are called asymmetric warfare systems. Long-range missiles, cunning, hard to detect uh, diesel submarines, um, drone warfare, uh, vast amounts of uh, torpedo boats that go in a swarm. So the question that was raised here is if we think that we are going to continue the American naval forward posture on the other side of the Pacific, and p perhaps in particular, carry out our defense obligations to Japan, to Korea, and be uh, there to anticipate something that might happen against uh, Taiwan. Is it right and is it prudent to think that the large aircraft carrier platform is the best thing to have in the light of the shifting technologies of warfare on the sea and under the sea and in the air? And frankly, the answer is we do not know. There is a great battle inside the US Navy itself between the carrier lobby, which has been so strong since the end of the Second World War, and those who say this is dangerous to assume that the big battle uh, platforms of the past are going to be effective in the light of maybe swarms of dozens, if not hundreds, of long-range, high-speed uh, missiles coming towards those carriers in any conflict over Taiwan and the Taiwan Straits. I think I saw that uh, you'd had a visitation here at the, at the school maybe a year or two ago of uh, Admiral Jim Stavridis, and maybe some of you have read uh, that fu futuristic novel of his, which he co-authored uh, just last year, called um, 2034. And it is a sort of battle of dorking futuristic novel of a conflict which breaks out between Chinese smaller forces and larger American ships going to a shootout and going to the Chinese using missiles. And the more heavy ships we send into this conflict, the more of them get sunk by a plethora of missile attacks. This is a US admiral, somebody who was uh, you know, head in the Mediterranean fleet and then NATO, offering the suggestion that our big vessel systems, which may have worked in the past, could not be the right technology for staying ahead of naval challenges in the future. Some of you who looked and shook your head 
at the fate of a very, very large uh, Russian destroyer, Moskva. The lead destroyer is there. And uh, if you believe the claims of the Ukrainian forces that it was hit by two sea-skimming missiles, which then set off the fires in the Moskva, may probably are causing all of the admiralties of the world to be asking this big question. Does one have the right surface platform uh, equipment to handle the future world of mass missile attacks on your navies? And I don't know. Do we have sufficient uh, uh, anti-missile defenses on our ships? Uh, uh, Aegis uh, protection systems which would keep those missiles uh, from afar or destroy them in the air. If we have an Aegis system which could destroy the first 80 oncoming missiles, but there's still another 20 coming in, what would be the fate of our large platforms? This is a really good question about something which surely must be causing anxiety in the Department of Defense and in the Navy. If it isn't, it should. Thanks for the question. Do we have another one from the room? Back corner over here, yes. Hello, Professor Kennedy. My name is Jan Park, and I'm a postdoctoral fellow here at the uh, Center for Grand Strategy at uh, Texas A&M. Uh, I'm interested in your sort of uh, different, how different intellectual frameworks have shaped your views of history and, and uh, how the world works. So you've mentioned uh, Berdellian historiography and obviously uh, international relations theory as well, but you're also the authority on geopolitics. You've written things about um, Mekinder and Mahan. I haven't looked at your book yet, but uh, I, I, I'm interested in how the, the geopolitical literature has affected your views of history. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Ian was a painter of warships in the wonderful historic and, uh, and, and topographical context uh, in the school of, um, I would say, of, of Constable as much as of Turner. And he set them in context, which you might call geographical. But he didn't think about geopolitics, which is the impact of geography upon politics and strategy as between the positions of individual great powers, whether they're rising or they're already established ones. And yes, that is a big question, uh, an area of study which is significant, is the, is the fact that 400 or 500 years ago, uh, with the coming of the long-range sailing ship, which you could put small guns on, and send out from Portugal and Spain and Great Britain to transform the world because they could sail all the way around Africa into the Indian Ocean and begin to change the balances there because of their geopolitical position of the, of the uh, originator nations and because new technologies added to the advantages which the West already had if Later on, there are shifts in the geopolitics of world order with the coming of the railway in engine, the invention of uh, a couple of people 200 years ago, close to where Professor Kennedy was born in the northeast of England, George and Robert Stevenson. Uh, I sometimes think when I'm sitting in a hot tub, except it's ages since I sat in a hot tub, but when I do sit in a hot tub and I think about geopolitics and history, I sometimes wonder to myself what the world would have been like, what the United States would have been like without the steam engine invented by Watson, without the, uh, without the railway engine invented by Stevenson's in the 1820s. What would a world without railways and railway lines be to the opening up of Russia? and Siberia to the opening up of our Midwest. Technology interacts with geography. The countries which are may, do have this transformative technology can benefit from it. As the Chinese puzzle about all of these historic examples, 
of where technology and geopolitics interacts with each other. And when they look, as they really should, at that map of the entire globe and the northern hemisphere, and they see the vast bulging coastline of uh, China with its 1.4 billion people in it, with its large rivers going to the sea, with its huge manufacturing output now, with its landlocked borders giving them you know, headaches galore. Any, hands up anybody here who would like a, a 2,000 mile long border with Mr. Putin's Russia right now. Uh, and borders with another 13 countries, by the way. With the Chinese looking outwards into the Pacific and looking at that power that they hardly understand on the other side of the Pacific. How do you work geopolitics, new transformative technologies, asymmetric warfare, steadily rising GDP into your vision of where you might be in the year 2035 or 2045? When you look more narrowly at Taiwan and the Taiwan Straits, and when you learn that your great national leader is so, so hopeful that he might satisfy his father's dying hope and wish that China would one day in the future see Taiwan brought to it, and you put all of this in the mix, You've got to be really humble about thinking that you know what the future of the world is and who is going to be the winner in any context there. You just have to ha ask the awkward questions, be skeptical of somebody who knows the future of the world, be skeptical of someone who thinks that the U.S. is passé, totally, or somebody who thinks the U.S. is without a challenger, still on equal number one, that the U.S. can build large platforms when the other guys are building small, sneaky, really rather dangerous platforms. What does that mean? How do we explain to our Congress and our political leaders the difficulties of analysis and understanding of the complexities of world technology, geopolitics, and military affairs? It is not easy. That's why we try to teach it to our undergraduate students in the hope that sometime in the future, those people will take and do a far better job of things than maybe we have done and our leaders have done in the past few years, even though we haven't done too bad a job of it. Thanks for the question, though. And exactly what we try to do at the Bush School, too. So uh, you know, we share, shared a shared mission that hopefully will pay off. Kelly, do we have a question from the, uh, the Zoom audience? We do. Madi Sarambar, um, tagging on to the conversation that you just had, actually, has one that ties right in with that. Uh, to begin, he says, uh, U.S. Navy plans to retire all active duty warships in the next five years. The United States Navy has a total of 93 combat-worthy vessels. 68 Arleigh, Bar Arleigh Burke destroyers, three Zumwalt destroyers, 22 Ticonderoga cruisers. Earlier in 2021, the U.S. Navy rejected a plan to extend the operating life of Arleigh Bur Burke class destroyers due to a budget shortfall. That means the United States will lose 27 destroyers over a five-year period, vessels to be replaced with DDGX. The U.S. Navy has 11 aircraft carriers over the next five years with at least four operational. That is, on paper, regardless of the U.S. Navy destroyer operating coefficient, which was roughly 68% in 2021, there are only 41 destroyers that are ready and operational. It means they do not even have the ability to complete the emergency task force. His question is, is 2027 to 2032 the best time for China to invade Taiwan, because at that point, the U.S. ready to operate fleet is definitely smaller than China. He puts in parentheses, this is just a strike fleet. The anti-submarine warfare and uh, amphibious assault fleet are not included in the calculati calculations. FFGX is in charge of guarding the home shores. 
That was a that was a written question. I, it's clearly, <laughs> and we cannot repeat the question. I don't think I, I wouldn't be able to. But hopefully, you I think you could respond. Fritz, this is clearly a question for the audience. <laughs> <laughs> Look, this is a serious question about with too much detail in it. But still, what it is doing, ladies and gentlemen, is detailing the fact that over the next few years, a large number of the of the surface warships, significant surface warships, fleet destroyers and some cruisers and other things, are, are pretty well run through the 30 to 40 year life cycle to which, which is longer than they had been intended to when they were laid down in the like 18, 1980s and, and 1990s. This is, a, this is a dilemma for many navies. The, the European navies have kind of shriveled away to almost nothingness because of the high cost of the replacement of futuristic surface, uh, large surface uh, players and destroyers and, and, and cruisers because of the astonishing cost of elect electrics and avionics and detection systems there, meaning every new system seems to be about two to three times more expensive than the the type of uh, weapon or ship which was replaced. So we have this unfortunate coincidence of having built a very, very large number of, of surface warships when we were frightened about the rising Soviet Navy in the 1970s and 1980s. And that 30 or 40 year span means many of these uh, destroyers and cruisers very expensive to run uh, with larger number of technical and aging problems in the machinery and everything else like that with an invaluable crew which the Navy hopes to retain but then to move them into the more modern number of ships which are being built for us but in smaller numbers. So this is you may remember a joke many years ago, ladies and gentlemen, when you saw the staggering price of new, our new bomber aircraft or fighter aircraft. I think there was an economist, who try, a defense economist, who tried to predict the year out in the future when the entire US Air Force budget would be consumed by one aircraft because of an <laughs> exponential doubling every five years of the price of an, uh, a fighter aircraft. Uh, no joke to the planners here, no joke to the budget people, uh, no joke to the Congress because congressmen who takes defense uh, spending and defense requests seriously shake their head when they look at the incredible expense proposed of the new weapon systems but also see that the number of weapon systems that are being requested are far less than those of 30 or 40 years ago. So you replace like three destroyers and you get one destroyer for return. And when some planner says, oh, but Professor Kennedy, this new fleet destroyer, which will have so much more advanced detection systems, artificial intelligence built into it, avionics, or capacity to look over look over you know, the, the, the far end of the ocean, you're still left wondering, ladies and gentlemen, of whether it really is a good exchange to get one new state-of-the-art destroyer in place of three retiring destroyers, uh, because maybe numbers count. Maybe those Chinese who are willing to build a large, large number of smaller vessels all of them packed with long-range surface-to-surface missiles or surface-to-air missiles have something going with them. What if, as Tavridis suggests, you go there into harm's way with your new, uh, more expensive weapon systems and you find that you can knock down the first 25 attacking small torpedo boats and then the next 10 torpedo boats launch torpedoes against you and have you, you have no more defenses for it. I don't know the answer to that very, very lengthy, detailed question that we just heard here, 
But I think the questioner is onto something. There is this almost inevitable and inexorable law of the weapon systems that replace uh, uh, the retiring weapon systems being so much more expensive and therefore fewer, far fewer in number than, say, in Ronald Reagan's day. And when people tell you, well, boy, we, uh, we should have a 300-ship navy or 350-ship navy, then first of all, that is a huge increase in taxpayers' contribution to pay for it. It will take 10 years to build those systems. And it may well be that, if, of course, we start even designing now. Every warship you design, every weapons platform you design has built-in obsolescence from the beginning. This is kind of almost iron law of nature. And for the hegemonic power with large platforms in world affairs, this is our big, big defense budget headache. That's for sure. Perhaps we have time to squeeze in one more question. Kelly has another one from Zoom, I, I guess. This one is much shorter, I promise. Okay. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Take out your earplugs, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Jane, uh, whose father served on the USS Saratoga, asks, mm -hmm. Would you speak a little more about the activities of the Saratoga during World War II? Oh, wow, that's an interesting one. I don't know whether we can get back to, to uh, Ian's, it's about picture number or slide number, way, way back there. It's the Saratoga with the, uh, with the illustrious, the British aircraft carrier. Mm. Uh, this is, if we can get that, it's a wonderful painting by Ian. Uh, oh, we'll go there. <laughs> there it is on the, uh, 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 he was wonderful at s uh, the scene setting of the, the geographic scene setting of, of this vessel. Saratoga, it's a really interesting story, and I did not prompt this question, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> to come out of the blue, but Saratoga with the Lexington was planned by the U.S. Navy at the end of the First World War to be the super biggest, fastest, battle cruiser in the US fleet and in the world. We're gonna teach those limey battle cruisers what a real battle cruiser could be because it was gonna be bigger, faster, 33,000 tons. And then caramba, along comes the Washington Naval Treaties and you get told that you cannot have them as battle cruisers. You've got far too many battleships in the US Navy and the, and the admirals say, oh, well, please, can we convert them to an uh, aircraft carrier. And so they take away most of the guns and they put a flat top on it. And they've got such a big ship, it actually holds more aircraft than any of, uh, of the other aircraft carriers in the US Navy for, for these years. Uh, it's so big that they retain the secondary armament of eight inch guns that is on the side here, which are cruiser sized guns. And it's very fast. Uh, but it uh, was on its own after 1942-43 because while it operated in the, in, the, in the carrier battles in the Pacific, as I said, most of its sister carriers were, had been destroyed by, 19, um, by 1943 and it operated alone until the Essex-class carriers came with it. It had the most astonishing war record right through the Second World War. It sailed more miles than any other ship in the US Navy. It was still there to fight in the Battle of Lady Gulf in 1944. And it's only at the very end of the war, with all of the new Essex-class carriers in Admiral Nimitz's fleet, that the uh, Saratoga was sent home, no longer needed. A uh, rather unhappy destiny for this uh, great and wonderful aircraft carrier. It was Ian Marshall who told me and showed me the wonderful story of that uh, individual ship which tells a lesson, a larger lesson, about victory at sea. I'm glad you asked that question. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Paul, and uh, maybe we can extend another round of applause to thank Paul Kennedy for coming.